Hello reefers and aquarium lovers. My name is Jeremy Wade and I am your Canadian Reef Master. Today we're doing a tank tour of my Red Sea Reefer 250 for 2023. We're going to have a look at the setup, how it's running, how some of the coral are doing, and take a look at which coral are overtaking the tank and I'm going to have to frag soon. Let's have a look at how the tank is doing. This tank is the Red Sea Reefer 250. It is a 65 gallon system with a 54 gallon display tank and a 10 gallon sump. The lighting consists of two fifth generation Radeon XR15 Pro. These lights are excellent and have all of the necessary wavelengths to meet all the nutritional demands of the coral. At the beginning of 2022, I added a number of Acropora frags that I had selected from Frag Garage. I placed a number of these coral on the left side of the, my tank, allowing this area to fill in. There are still a few spaces left on the right side of my tank that I'm looking to get a few more Acropora in the near future. As we take a closer look at the reef tank, we see that the lower half of the tank is dominated by large polyp corals. These coral are better placed at the lower half of a mixed tank, as they require a lower amount of par. At the upper part of the tank, you can see that I have dominated it by Acropora species. Now this is how I have set up my tank every tank is going to be different. It's important to talk to the local reef shop about your specific setup. They will be able to guide you and give you general recommendation of where you should place your new coral in a tank. If a coral is receiving too much light, it may start to bleach or lighten in color. If the coral are not receiving enough light, the coral may darken in color. This may be a result of a selective evolutionary force on the zooxanthellae in the coral tissue and increased production of chlorophyll in the zooxanthellae as a result to increase the production of sugars through photosynthesis to meet the coral's nutritional demands. This beautiful staghorn is the centerpiece of my tank and has absolutely wonderful polyp extension in the evening time. This acro is exceptionally fast growing and I've had to frag it many times. My fabulous pink melopora is encrusting very well. However, I'm still waiting for that axle growth. My wild Australian acropora has done a lot of encrusting this year. However, recently it's shown signs of axle growth as you see here. One of my most flamboyant acropora in my tank is the Reef Raft PC Rainbow. This is a beautiful acropora that has every color of the rainbow. I broke the tip off, just a tiny piece, and I put that on a frag plug. Here it is a year later. It's uh, encrusted well and has some great growth. These again are two of my wild acropora from Australia. They've done a bit of coloring up, however, I felt like I should have put them up higher in the tank to get a bit more color out of them. A good friend gave me this wonderful TNT Anacropora. For SBS coral, this is less demanding and has a beautiful structure. This is a frag of one of my Miyagi torts. I lost the main mother colony in the display tank to unknown causes. Luckily, I had this frag in my 10 gallon budget reef tank and it grows exceptionally fast. I'm quite amused with the axle growth on this staghorn coral, and I'm interested to see how it turns out. The Red Planet Acropora is always a favorite for its bright coloration and great polyp extension. This teal echinata may not appear to have grown at all. However, I am continually breaking off branches and have a number of frags that are the size of small colonies themselves. There's a couple colonies around my tank. My rainbow loom had spent most of the year encrusting. However, recently it has just taken off to show some beautiful axle growth with that exceptional pink purple tip. We now come to a coral that has started to take over my tank, this beautiful Vietnamese orange frog spawn. The coral has grown to a size where it's starting to touch other coral and hide coral that are beneath it, such as a pink lobophilia. Frog swan belong to the genus Fimbrophiliae. 
which also includes the branching frog spawns, the hammer corals, the branching hammers, and the octospawns. Genetic analysis distinguished the species of the genus Fimbrophiliae from that of the genus Euphiliae, which include the torch corals. I feature the Indonesian green torch and the dragon soul torch in my tank for the wonderful contrast in colors. I find both the Fimbrophilia and the Euphilia genus really benefit from elevated magnesium levels. I keep mine around 1600 ppm. My Ricordia florida have grown over the year and divided, and I've added a few mushroom species to the tank on isolated rocks. You will find the Trachophilia or brain coral on the substrate, as well as my collection from the genus Homophilia which consists of the species Homophilia bauerbanki and Homophilia australis, or the scolemia coral. The genus Homophilia have absolute magnificent feeding displays at nighttime, as they attempt to capture food particles and prey from the water columns and transport it to their oral cavity where they digest it. I make sure that I feed all my LPS coral at least two to three times a week, some sort of mysis, shrimp, plankton, or LPS prepared food. This Duncan coral has grown from one polyp to over 60 polyps in two years. I moved this neon green candy cane coral that was a single polyp from my 10 gallon budget tank. It has now grown a number of polyps in just about two months. The Toxic Green Hynophora is either an encrusting or a branching coral. It's an LPS with a nasty punch and will kill anything that it touches. My Micromusa lordaoensis garden is looking wonderful and plush, and I've been able to take a few little frags off it to start new little colonies. Now that we have had a look at the coral that live in the tank, we're going to have a look at how the tank is run. Under the tank there is the sump which consists of a refugium as well as the other filters that run the tank. The Red Sea Reefer sump is designed to have multiple stages of filtration. In the first stage of filtration there are the bioballs and carbon. I switched out the filter sock that originally was with the tank with a secondary cup to put the carbon in. I place a polyfloss on top of the bioballs and the carbon, which captures any fine particulate in the tank. I switch this out every two to three days. The second stage of filtration is the refugium. There are many functions of this space. I have a bit of live rock in it at this time. The third section of the sump contains the majority of the filtration. This includes the protein skimmer and a phosphate reactor that contains a ferric oxide substrate that removes phosphate from the water column. This section also contains the heater as well as a number of other probes that are used to monitor the tank. These probes measure the temperature, pH, conductivity, and redox of the tank. These probes are connected to the GHL Profilux Aquarium Controller. I have also added the GHL KH Director to monitor and manage my alkalinity throughout the day, and I'm hoping to add the Ion Director to this setup. I use a saturated solution of bicarbonate or baking soda to manage my alkalinity. The KH Director tests the water's alkalinity eight times a day, it then adjusts the dose of bicarbonate accordingly to the measured value to increase or decrease the alkalinity in the tank. This allows a constant alkalinity of about 8.3 to be maintained and in turn a stable pH in the tank. Here you have two dosing containers with independent dosers. One replenishes the saline removed from the tank when you do alkalinity tests, and the second is a saturated solution of Kalkwasser that doses throughout the night. I do this to help maintain the pH of the tank at night during hours of reduced photosynthesis. Here we'll take a look at some of the resupplies that I use to run my tank. 
I start with looking at the reef test kits that I use, the Red Sea line, they're a very good test kit. I don't use the LG uh, management, no pox, uh, I just have it because I bought it once, I've never used it. These are my bulk additives. This is calcium chloride, calcloser, magnesium sulfate, and magnesium chloride. I use a number of supplements in my reef tank. Here you see the Red Sea line of supplements. I use my test kits to make sure that all these values are within parameters. Here is my carbon as well as vibrant that I use sometimes, uh, even though there's a controversy. You have my Rofos phosphate remover as well as my potassium supplement, making sure that I do uh, test that value with the Red Sea test kit. Finally, you have my Aquaphor supplements of strontium and fluorine, my alkalinity supplement of bicarbonate, as well as my Reef Energy Plus Coral Nutrition by Red Sea. So far, I have focused on the coral in the tank. However, there are a number of absolutely fabulous fish that also inhabit it. The Bengay Cardinal is one of my favorite fish you can keep for the reef aquarium. They are easy to keep, very hardy, and will often pair up and breed in your reef tank. Here you see the male Bengay Cardinal tumble the eggs in his mouth as he makes sure they are clean and oxygenates them. The male broods the eggs in his mouth for about a month. When he releases them, they are perfect replicas of the parents. My purple tang is the real showpiece of the tank. He is doing very well and eats a wide range of foods that I prepare and provide him. One of the more elusive fish in my tank is my mandarin goby. He eats mice's shrimp and is most often seen at dusk when he comes out to perform a courtship dance to attract a female. The last fish in the tank is of course Jimbo the drag clownfish. This clownfish is a bit nippy and tends to bite at my hand anytime I'm doing any tank maintenance. It is amazing to watch the reef tank mature and grow. As the coral grows, I'm able to frag it and offer it to local hobbyists. This helps offset the cost of the aquarium and allows me to also buy other beautiful coral that I may farm and offer to hobbyists as well. The Red Sea Reefer 250 has had some absolute tremendous growth through 2022, and I am excited to see what it's going to do as it reaches three years of age in 2023. This year is looking like it will be exciting for the reefer. I am loving the growth, it is plush, and everything is looking absolutely fabulous. I hope you've enjoyed this video for my 2023 Red Sea Reefer 250 Reef Aquarium update and tank tour. If you like reef and aquarium related videos like this, check out my channel and some of my other videos. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit the notification button so you know when I post future videos. Take care everybody.